and welcome back to Tech Tuesday. I am Steve Leahy. Okay, so this Tech Tuesday, I wanted to take a step way back. This Tech Tuesday is for the person who is just starting out, hasn't bought an airbrush, and really is kind of confused on what to buy. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you a couple different styles of airbrushing or airbrushes, uh, not really brand specific so much as more what they do and how they do it. So that'll help you kind of as you're looking uh, for your own airbrush. Uh, to get started. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, hang on and let's go. Okay, before I get into which airbrush would be the best for you, uh, it might help to kind of go over how these brushes work a little bit. Uh, they're, the, the way that they work is pretty much the same um, as far as the operation of the airbrush. Uh, what really is different is how that paint feeds onto the onto the needle of the brush. So basically inside of this airbrush is a needle and there is usually a paint reservoir that's attached to that airbrush somewhere. And the way, the basic way that an airbrush works is once you get the air flowing through there, it creates a little vacuum right here in the front of the airbrush. And that vacuum draws the paint through coats this little tiny needle and then that paint is atomized off of that very fine needle and gives you that really fine controllable spray. So that's kind of the basic rundown. Uh, we can get into a lot more of the, the science and, and physics of, of an airbrush and the way that it works, but I think for a practical application, uh, that description will really help you out and get, kind of get you going. So once you know that, um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot different than a spray can. A spray can has the paint and the aerosol, or the air essentially, mixed together in a can and then both of those are forced out via pressure when you push down the button. This is different. That vacuum is what draws the paint through. And the fact that the paint is being pulled through the airbrush and not pushed, it becomes a big deal as you start to get into this and picking the right brush. So. Again, real basic, um, what you want to look for is a double action airbrush. There are very few single action airbrushes left on the market, so that makes it easy. But a double action just means that you have both control of the airflow on and off and the paint flow, which is back and forward. So those are the double action. A single action will only have uh, the control of air right here. The paint flow control is usually the separate por uh, part of the airbrush, usually up at the front. But again, they're rare now, so you don't have to really worry about running into them. You really want a double action. You want that, you know, push down for air and then pull back and forth for the amount of paint. Again, this isn't really, we really want to look at the, the airbrush and, and how it works as far as the flow goes to help you really pick the right brush for you. So the way that the paint feeds into the airbrush plays a big role in how that airbrush works. In this case, in this SADA airbrush, this Graph 2, this is a gravity feed brush. So what happens is the paint cup sits on directly on top of the airbrush and is fed directly into the bottle. Now, it still uses the same vacuum to pull that paint through, but because the paint cup has gravity to help it as well, the paint actually will flow through the, the airbrush even if there's no air. Uh, that really helps in the way that it flows. So let me show you the, uh, the, each one of the airbrushes and I'll kind of go into why one is, is more suited for a specific type of job. So that's the first type, it's a gravity feed. We'll put that guy right here. The next guy is a siphon feed. And the siphon fed brushes have the reservoir at the bottom. Now what's nice about the siphon feeds is they usually have different bottles and cup configurations that you can get for them. But what happens with this is the vacuum that's created is what draws the paint up into this airbrush. Uh, and that's how it works. The trigger action, again, is exactly the same. It's pushed down for air and pull back for paint. Uh, but the way that paint is pulled up through this brush uh, plays a little bit different role in that one. So that's the second kind for the feed. Put that guy here. This one, essentially, this one is the uh, Pache Millennium airbrush. Again, brand doesn't make too much difference at this point. Um, I'll talk a little bit about brand at the end, but, um, but uh, for the most part, we're just looking at the way that the paint works. The last type you'll find is the side feed, and that's where the paint actually kind of attaches right to the side of the airbrush. This is, a, um, this is the Artist 2 from, from FB. Um, and again, the trigger works the same way. It's pushed down for air and pulled back for paint, so that's all the same. But with the side feed, it's kind of a hybrid between the two, the gravity feed over here and then the siphon feed. So the paint is put in this cup, it goes down through this tube and then 
uh, enters the airbrush on the side. So this, uh, this brush will, um, will kind of work a little kind of both ways. It's got that, the help of gravity, but it also uses that siphon pull. Um, so since I have this one, let's talk about the advantages of a side feed. Out of the three, this is the least common. Usually an airbrush company will have maybe one side feed in their lineup, and the rest of them will be like these two guys right here. Uh, but the side feed is kind of unique. One of the neat applications of a side feed, and I don't know, yeah, this is kind of tight, but what you can do with the side feed cup is you can actually tilt it. So if you're spraying straight down, for instance, uh, that cup will still be upright. If you're working on a ceiling, you can actually do that as well. Um, again, it's just a neat little little extra feature. The other nice thing is in most cases with these, with these airbrushes, you can buy different size cups for the side as well. So that's also kind of a neat feature. Uh, the other thing that I hear a lot about the side feeds is that it gets the cup out of the way of your line of vision. I don't really feel that that was ever a big deal with the other two brushes, mostly because with a gravity feed with a cup on top, you're never really looking straight down the airbrush while you're working. For me, it's always from the side anyway, and the cup is off to the side even on a gravity feed. So that vision thing, uh, while it sounds like it, you know, it is a nice feature, I never really noticed that on any of the other brushes that those cups were in the way of, of what I was working on. So that is the side feed. What the side feeds traditionally were good for um, or where they were mostly used was illustration and finer work. And that's mostly because of the way that the, the nozzle and needle are set up in the brush. And I'll get into that after we kind of go over the sides too, or the, the, the different styles of, of feed. So that's, that's our side feed right there. And I thought I had, there it is. I said, I was thinking I had another magnet and I do. All right. So with the siphon feed again, the bottle plugs in the bottom and um, it's, it's ready to go. Um, siphon feed brushes generally, well, let's talk about the needle and nozzles, because if I can get that out of the way, then that'll make the rest of it make sense. So in each one of these airbrushes, there is a needle and a nozzle. Um, and the way that you determine the thickness of the paint that this airbrush can produce is how, how heavy that needle, or more specifically, how wide open that nozzle is. So the bigger the nozzle, the thicker the paint it can run. That's the general rule of thumb with that. So the way that they'll mark it is they'll either mark it uh, by its actual opening dimension, which is usually a fraction of a millimeter, uh, or they'll give it a, a number designation. Uh, the American companies do that a lot. So Pache and Badger, for instance, have a number one, number three, and number five uh, nozzle and needle. I believe Grex uses the same system. No, they, they actually use the measurement too. Um, so the one, three, and five, all you need to do is go to their website and you can actually get the actual opening measurement of that. And uh, usually those openings are done in millimeters or fractions of millimeters. Um, so what happens is that, again, the larger the opening, the thicker the paint. So siphon feed airbrushes have been extremely popular with t-shirt artists for that reason. They generally come with a little bit heavier opening or wider opening in a nozzle so that they can deal with that heavier t-shirt paint. The other nice thing too for t-shirt artists is they can plug a bottle, a big two ounce bottle or four ounce bottle directly on the bottom of this airbrush and they never have to pull that out. They, they rarely run out of paint. It takes them a long time to go through all that. So again, the high volume and the thicker paint is what they look for with a siphon feed brush. Now on the other side of that, the gravity feed brushes tend to have smaller needles and nozzle openings. So for instance, an Anthem like this has roughly about a 0.7 millimeter, 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter opening in it. A smaller gravity feed brush will have a nozzle opening that's about half that size. So smaller needles and nozzles process thinner paint better. And they, as a result, they're better for small areas, for finer spray and more controlled, but they don't handle very thick paint very well. So while you could do a t-shirt with this brush, it wouldn't, it wouldn't play very nice. You'd have to thin the paint out a lot and it just wouldn't be efficient for that. But on the other side of that, for doing scale modeling or fine illustration, a small gravity feed airbrush works really, really well for that. Gravity feed brushes just by nature can run at a slightly lower air pressure as well because they have that assist from the gravity where this guy still has to use the siphon action to pull that up and the siphoning happens from that, 
that higher air pressure. So these gravity feeds are generally better for closer detail work. Again, I say this as a generalization because you could buy a good versatile airbrush, gravity feed or siphon feed, and you could do so much with it. Um, and to think, you know, like, like most of us airbrushers will have way more than one airbrush. Uh, you'll generally tend to have one of, you know, at least one of each style along the way as well. So don't feel like you have to buy all in one airbrush and that's the one you're going to be stuck with for the rest of your life. But you also know that one brush will do a whole bunch of stuff. Again, I could paint a t-shirt with this brush. It would just be a little bit different job, just as I could kind of get away with some detail with this one. But again, it's a different job because of the way that the, the nozzle allows more, more fluid to go through. So first thing to do when you're looking for an airbrush, decide what you really plan on doing with it. If you feel, see yourself doing scale modeling with it or finer you know, illustration work, um, a gravity feed is probably going to be a better choice for you. If you see yourself doing more heavy duty work like ceramics or t-shirts or mural work, um, the bigger siphon feed brushes may be a good start for you. Um, again, the side feeds are great. There aren't that many of them out there. So, um, so if you, if you really feel the need for one, um, it can do a little bit of everything. Um, so, uh, so that's, but again, it's mostly, I've seen these mostly used for, for finer, you know, detail type, type work. Now, not to add some confusion to this, but there are airbrushes like the Anthem where you can take out the nozzle and needle and swap it out with other brushes. Another good example of that is the Grex XGI. This airbrush is a gravity feed brush, but you can remove the nozzle and needle and put all different size air, uh, nozzles and needles in this, uh, which will allow it to spray all different kinds of paints. So not to add confusion to it, but if you see an airbrush that has multiple size nozzles and needles, that's the idea behind it, that it can just be very, very versatile for you. So that's, that's the rundown. So hopefully that gets you started. Now I didn't, I'm not gonna talk too much about brands. My, my big thing with brands, um, and you'll find people love their brand. If you go online, people will swear by all different kinds of brands. Um, what I would suggest doing though is sticking with a brand that is um, established and that you can not only have questions answered from the person you bought it from, but also that they have spare parts. Uh, there are items on these airbrushes that are wear and tear, like the needles and the nozzles, that you're gonna have to replace over time. You don't wanna get into a situation where you buy an unsupported airbrush. And the ones I'm specifically talking about are the, a lot of the Chinese uh, knockoff airbrushes that are really exp inexpensive out there. Um, they are attractive because they're very inexpensive. And if you really wanna just kinda get your feet wet and not put a whole bunch of money into it, um, there's that option but generally they're not supported, meaning you, it's difficult to get spare parts for them uh, and there's no one to ask questions either about them. So that is my warning with that. Again, if you know, at, at a very small fraction of the price of a brand name brush, those uh, generic brushes seem very attractive, just know what you're getting into. Be okay with putting it in the trash bin uh, instead of you know, kind of sticking with it or, or replacing parts in it, all right? So hopefully that Tech Tuesday helped you out and got you started. If you have any questions um, or if there's something I kind of flew over really quickly and you want a little bit of clarification on that, please put your uh, comments down below. Um, if you enjoyed this, please also consider liking and subscribing. And for Steve Leahy and Tech Tuesday, I will catch you all on the next one.